DiscerningHearts.com presents Wisdom from the Western Isles, The Hermit, by David Torkington. David Torkington, the author of The Wisdom from the Western Isles, has re-edited and abridged the work for broadcast. He is also the narrator. The book was originally published as three separate spiritual novels, Peter Calvey, Hermit, Peter Calvey, Prophet, and Peter Calvey, Mystic. We begin with the first part, The Hermit, but including some passages from Peter Calvey, Mystic, so as to give an overall view of the spiritual journey for listeners. We now present Wisdom from the Western Isles, The Hermit, Episode 6, A Blueprint for Prayer, Hour, narrated by David Torkington. I was so pleased that Peter agreed to come on the Saturday morning before I left for the mainland. But even so, there was not much time left, and I wanted him to give me some more practical advice about what to do in the time that I'd already decided to give for prayer. So, uh, as soon as Peter sat down, I put it to him without delay. Peter smiled. He had obviously anticipated my request. He reached into the top pocket of his jacket and took out what turned out to be a small homemade booklet on prayer. You may find this helpful, he said. In it you'll find my patent blueprint for prayer. Quite a few people have found it useful as a memory jog, particularly as they can carry it around with them in their heads. Now, yesterday I said that the Lord's Prayer is the pattern of all Christian prayer, and that this prayer is in itself summed up in the first two words, Our Father. Now, in the blueprint, as you'll see, I've used each letter of the Our Father as a reminder of nine indispensable ingredients that should feature in our daily prayer. But before I go any further, let me make it as clear as possible the very essence of Christian prayer, as introduced and practiced by the founder of Christianity, Jesus Christ himself. In the religion in which he was brought up, the supreme act of prayer was embodied in the worship that was offered to God in sacrifice, the sacrifice made at the temple in Jerusalem. Although Jesus uh, participated in virtually all forms of Jewish prayers and religious practices, there's no evidence that he ever offered sacrifice in the temple at Jerusalem. The reason why is crucial. It was because he came to introduce a new form of prayer, a new form of worship, which he told the Samaritan woman was a worship in spirit and in truth. The Gospels record that Jesus went into the temple to say prayers with his disciples, to preach and to teach there, but there's no record of him actually sacrificing like everyone else. Even on the great feast days, like the Passover. But but why not, I said. Well, let me explain, said Peter. Let me explain by describing how Jesus prepared for the final Passover feast that he wanted to share with his disciples. It was at this feast that he would introduce them to the new worship that would embody the true Christian prayer that was at the heart and soul of his own personal spiritual life. He began by sending St. Peter and St. John into Jerusalem to make preparations. Now, these preparations were twofold. The room had to be booked and the food had to be procured. Let us presume that it was St. John who bought the Paschal lamb. He would then take it to the temple where, in the traditional way, it would be killed and offered in sacrifice for him by one of the priests. Once offered by a person with a pure and humble heart, it was believed that God would come down to take possession of the lamb that had been offered to him. What was, therefore, John's lamb would become God's lamb, or the Lamb of God. 
This sacred food, now believed to be impregnated with and possessed by the presence of God, became the main dish at the Passover, over which Jesus presided shortly before his death. As each one ate from the same sacred food, they believed that they would be not only united in some mystical way with God, but in him with each other too. After the old rite that symbolized this union was over, Jesus enacted the new rite that brought about a real physical and spiritual union with himself. There was now no need for a new lamb, no need to go back to the temple, no need for a priest to offer it to God for them as before. Why? Because Jesus himself was the new temple, present at the table, the new high priest was sitting next to them, who would offer the new sacrifice that would supersede all previous offerings, because it was the offering of himself, as the new Lamb of God made man, as St. John the Baptist had called Jesus over two years before. On that, the holiest of nights, and before their very eyes, Jesus became present to them, No, within them in a new way in which he would be able to remain with them to the consummation of the world, as he promised moments before he ascended into heaven. Through the bread and wine he became present not just as a living, breathing person, but as an utterly selfless, loving person in the very act of loving God with his whole heart and mind, with his whole body, and with his whole strength. But that's not all, for the very food and drink through which he chose to make himself present within them proclaims an even more incredible truth. For those who consume this sacred food and drink, as the apostles did first, would gradually begin to embody Christ within them, not just in their being, but in their acting in the very way they would love one another, and others too, who, seeing a quality of love that they'd never seen before, wanted to give up their pagan way of life, to live and die as the first Christians did. Peter stopped speaking and remained silent for a moment or two, before asking me a question. Um, uh, James, have you ever read the Mass of the Roman Rite, by the Jesuit priest, Professor Joseph Jungmann. Sorry, I said, uh, I've never heard of him. Then may I encourage you to do so without delay, Peter said, because it is a masterpiece. I can assure you that it will soon become the accepted classical work on the history and meaning of the Mass. When I did finally read it, it was when the Vatican Council was publishing its document on the liturgy, enabling me to see that it was indebted to the writings of the great Jesuit liturgist, Josef Jungmann, more than anyone else. If I had my way, Peter said, I would have his profound words written in every Catholic church throughout the world. The Mass, he wrote, should so form us that the whole of our lives become the Mass, the place where we continually offer ourselves to God in Christ through all we say and do each day. This is the new worship in spirit and in truth that Jesus first promised to the Samaritan woman. Now these words are so important, so deep, so sublime, that I must explain them in more detail if we're going to plumb the depth of the greatest mystery of our faith. When Jesus was alive on earth, he went to the synagogue each day at nine, twelve and three o'clock with his family, Mary and Joseph. 
There he would say a prayer called the Sheba, in which he would continually recommit himself to God by promising, in the words of the greatest of the commandments, to love God with his whole mind and heart, with his whole body, with his whole soul, and with his whole strength. When he left home to form a new family with his disciples, he continued to practice this daily prayer with them. After his resurrection, his disciples continued to do what they'd learned to do with him. However, in a changing world, without the synagogues anymore, in which they used to pray before, Christians nevertheless continued to dedicate their lives to God, just as Jesus had done at home and first thing in the morning. Gradually, a Christian version of the Shema developed with which to begin the day. Eventually, it came to be called the morning offering, and it became the prayer that reminded Catholics throughout subsequent centuries to make their forthcoming day into the Mass, the place where they continue to offer themselves to God in, with, and through Christ, through all that they said and did. Although the first Christians could no longer go to the synagogue and, as Christian churches had not been built yet, they nevertheless tried to pause, as Jesus and his disciples did, at nine, twelve, and three o'clock, to help turn their whole lives into a prayer. Not any prayer, but the supreme prayer, as Christ did before them. This is how they tried to practice what St. Paul called the prayer without ceasing. Although what Peter had just said deeply moved me, a question did occur to me. Do modern Christians have to understand ancient Jewish spirituality in order to understand their own faith? No, uh, not in detail, said Peter, but it helps. And at least in outline, it should always be part of their education. Let me tell you how I explained the meaning of the Mass as it was understood and practiced in the early church to a, a group of Catholics on the island of Barra just a year ago without giving the biblical background. Father Callum asked me to give the talk because he knew I'd just studied Father Youngman's masterpiece. The whole life of Jesus Christ was the Mass, said Peter emphatically. It was the place where at every single moment of his life, everything he said and did was offered to God his Father. From the moment he was born in a wooden crib to the moment he died on a wooden cross, he was practicing the first and greatest of all the commandments by loving God with his whole heart and mind, with his whole body and soul, and with his whole strength. Sometimes he was doing this directly in prayer. Sometimes he was doing it indirectly through every word and action that made up his daily life, most especially by the way he loved everyone as he loved himself. It was at the Last Supper that his lifelong self-offering of himself to the Father was summed up and embodied in his body made bread and wine in the first Eucharist. From then onwards, and for all time, this sacrament would enable Christ not just to be with his people, but in them, as they endeavoured to live in their lives the self-offering that Jesus practised throughout his life, from his birth to his death. Before his death and glorification, his disciples tried to imitate his example in the way he loved his father, directly in prayer and indirectly in the neighbor in need. But it was only after Pentecost that the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead drew his disciples into his mystical body so they could do what they could never have done before. Why? because henceforth they would be doing everything in, with, and through Christ, their risen Lord, for whom all things were possible, even the impossible. What happened to the first disciples happened to later disciples too, and that includes us. 
This is thanks to our rebirth into the mystical body at baptism and our continual replenishment, renewal and restoration in the sacrifice of the Mass. It is here in the sacrament of the Mass that in, with and through Christ we receive the fullness of God's love to the measure in which we have offered ourselves in, with and through him even before we came into the church to celebrate the Mass. And it is this, our self-offering, which determines the measure in which the whole of our lives become the Mass, as the whole life of Christ was his Mass. Peter, I said, I find what you've just said mind-blowing. At least it's mind-blowing to me. But is is what you're saying all true? Is this truly the way in which the first Christians conceived of what later came to be called the Mass? Absolutely, said Peter. Once the first Christians had relished what they had received in their weekly Holy Communion, they were full of joy because of the union they experienced with God and of the fraternal union they experienced with each other and the offering that they had just made in, with, and through Christ, knowing that it would be accepted and returned a hundredfold. Despite all the offerings made in the past, Christ made it clear to his followers that the only offering that Christ really wanted in future is the offering of themselves. That is why We are all called to become priests. Why? Because only we can offer ourselves. No one can do it for us. As St. Peter put it, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a consecrated nation, a people set apart. However, only Christ can make this offering effective because it is made in and together with his offering offering his supreme sacrifice. That is why the early Christians were so aware of their priesthood. But they did not just exercise their priesthood at Mass each Sunday, but with the love they received at Mass, they tried to exercise it in every moment of every day of their lives. Once again, then, this is how they tried to practice the prayer without ceasing. Then, when they returned the following week, they would offer up all the sacrifices they'd made to receive from God in return far more than they had given. In this way, they would be caught up in an endless cycle of giving and receiving, death and resurrection, that would fit them ever more fully into the mystery of Christ to receive his love in ever greater measure in return. It was this love, a quality of love that non-believers had never seen before, that moved them so deeply that more and more of them came knocking on the door, so more and more places had to be set at table. But how did you come to realize these profound truths, I said? (laughs) Gradually, Peter answered. But truth to tell, they began with my mother. She told me that by offering all I said and did to God in the day ahead of me, that I could become, as she put it, a little priest, turning ordinary commonplace things into something precious, as Rumpelstiltskin turn straw into gold. When our family went to Mass each Sunday, they saw their mother totally absorbed in what they took all too easily for granted. Their selfishness meant that they had too little to offer, while she was offering a thousand and one acts of self-sacrifice made for them during the previous week. This meant that she received to the measure of her giving For as St. Francis once put it, it is in giving that we receive. Without any formal theological education, she discovered for herself that the Mass is not only a sacrifice, the place where we offer ourselves in, with and through Christ to the Father, but something more. 
It is also a sacred sacrificial meal where we receive the love that he is endlessly pouring out onto and into all who would receive it, not just at Mass, but throughout our daily sacrificial giving. It was here that she received the help and strength she needed to go on selflessly giving in the forthcoming week for the family that she loved so much. Each day she reminded herself of this, her sacred calling, by making her morning offering, as her recusant ancestors had done for hundreds of years before her. If I... If I ever forgot to say mine, she used to remind me by quoting the cure de ours who would say, All that we do without offering it to God is wasted. And he was right. The housekeeper suddenly appeared to summon Peter to the telephone, but he immediately returned, looking at his watch. I'll have to be brief if I want to explain the first three letters of my blueprint for prayer. They are, if you remember, O-U-R. I've already spent enough time with the letter O for morning offering, so now for the next letter, U for union. It was my mother who first taught me something that I'll never forget. She said that even though I may make my morning prayer alone by the side of my bed, I was never alone. My prayer would always be made in, with, and through Jesus, and so with all other Christians wherever they were, I would pray in union with them. This also means that we can pray too with all the saints who are alive in Christ as we are, and for all my own relatives and friends, both living and dead. She especially taught me to pray in the same way for the holy souls in purgatory. My mother also told me that this was the perfect opportunity to pray for others, especially those who have asked us to pray for them. She said, when you hear about people who are suffering all over the world, on the radio, the television, or in the newspaper— you can reach out to them now through prayer because prayer is not limited by the space and time world in which we live. One morning, a lay brother, believing that he was out, burst into Padre Pia's room to find him lost in prayer. The saint dismissed his apologies. Not at all, not at all, he said. I was just praying for a happy death for my father. "'But your father died two years ago,' the brother said, looking rather surprised. Padre Pio looked at him in disbelief. "'I know he did,' he said. "'True Christian prayer is not limited by the world of space and time in which we live. "'It takes us up into another dimension where, in the mystical body of Christ, "'it can reach out now to help those in need in the four corners of the world.' and just as easily to the needy in the past and the needy in the future. The wonderful thing about praying for others in the morning is that they can be included in the prayer, the prayer without ceasing, that becomes the rest of our day. This is why our prayer can be so effective, because it draws its power not just from what is said in a brief moment, but from what is done in a whole day that we try to offer like Christ before us to our common Father in heaven. Now, the third letter in the blueprint is the letter R for reviewing, Peter said. And it is to remind us that, despite what I've said before, the morning offering is not a magic formula. It does not automatically transform the forthcoming day. That's why something further is required. After making the morning offering, then, spend a few moments reviewing the day ahead. Make a few resolutions. That will enable you to try to consecrate every moment of that day to loving God in all you say and do. It may be by pausing for a few moments of prayer during the day, as the early Christians were taught to do by Jesus himself, 
but also in doing simple humdrum tasks that you keep putting off, like changing the sheets on the bed, putting air into the car tyres, defrosting the freezer, or something that's more important. There's always that friend or relative who is sick or in need, whom we should telephone or make contact with, or even visit for a few minutes. We might have to make a resolution to apologise to one of the family, a friend, or someone at work for whom we behaved rather badly the previous day. It is very difficult to stand up for someone who has been abused by authority at work or elsewhere, or speak the truth when no one wants to hear it, or to make a stand for what we know is right. But nevertheless, these are some of the more important things that should occupy our minds as part of our morning prayer. In this way, every day is a day in which we spend every single moment trying to observe the new commandments, firstly by loving God and then by loving him in the neighbor in need, just as Jesus did. But now, since the sending of the Holy Spirit, we can observe the first commandment like never before because we are loving God in, with, and through Christ. And we are observing the second commandment too by loving our neighbor not just as ourselves, as the Jews were told to do in the Old Testament, but as Jesus told us to do at the Last Supper, as he loves us. As this love makes its home in us, it reaches out to others through us to bring about God's kingdom of love, his new world order where love reigns supreme and justice and peace rule where anarchy and self-love and personal gain rule before. As Peter was leaving, he said, James, I'm afraid I have some bad news for you. The phone call that I received earlier was from the air terminal. Fog is forecast for tomorrow. And so... I'm afraid your flight has been cancelled. If Peter had not been in such a hurry, he would have seen me jumping for joy, particularly when he gave me further bad news that there was, as usual, no flight on a Sunday, so I wouldn't be able to leave until Monday at the earliest. Peter didn't know, but I'd been praying for something like this, and my prayer had been answered. William Coper was indeed right. God does work in wonderful ways, his wonders to perform. This concludes Episode 6, A Blueprint for Prayer, Hour, from Wisdom from the Western Isles, The Hermit, narrated by its author, David Torkington. To hear and or to download other episodes from this series, as well as hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find it inside the Discerning Hearts free app, as well as on the Discerning Hearts YouTube channel. The music performed in this episode was by Catholic concert pianist Vincent Bellington, and the audio production of the program was produced and edited by Bobby Torkington. We hope that if this program has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, and if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation which is fully tax-deductible to help support the efforts of Discerning Hearts to bring listeners around the world freely spiritual formation of this kind. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us once again for more from Wisdom from the Western Isles, The Hermit, with David Torkington.